Hello everyone, um, so today I'm talking to you from Newcastle and I'm actually going to be discussing with you uh, the research that we've been doing at Newcastle University um, into Charles Bonnet syndrome. So for people who aren't aware, Charles Bonnet syndrome is the name that we give to a symptom that several people with sight loss get, um, which is uh, visual hallucinations following sight loss. So this is actually quite a common symptom um, that not necessarily a lot of people know about, that when you start to lose your sight, suddenly you might start seeing images of uh, people or animals or objects that aren't actually there. These can also, these images can also be quite simple. So they can be colors or they could be patterns or shapes. And when it first starts happening, it can be quite scary because you don't quite know what's going on. And uh, of course, when you say the word visual hallucination, a lot of people start to think about things like dementia or mental illness. And this is not something that people really want to be thinking about, especially when you've just started to lose your sight. However, the good news is, is that it is actually fairly normal. Uh, and what it is, is it's actually to do with the brain, not the eyes. So when the brain starts to notice that you're losing your sight, sometimes it can react a little bit oddly. So it's, it's trying to fill in the gaps of what you usually had. So if you look at this particular diagram here, uh, this is your brain. And when you have light entering your eyes normally, the eye starts to send signals to the brain and the brain starts to make sense of what it is that you're seeing. So it will then send those signals to different parts of the brain, for example, the memory areas of the brain um, and trying to work out what it is that you're actually seeing. And this usually works quite normally. This is all, uh, this is how it would usually work when your sight is fine. However, if you see in this case, you've now got eye disease, which means that unfortunately that light that's entering your eyes, it's either being blocked completely or it's actually just not really getting through how it's supposed to. So those signals that are now going to the back of your brain, they're not how they should be. So they're a bit degraded. And the brain can sometimes find this a little bit confusing because it's getting this information through that it's, it isn't complete or, or it's not getting information at all. But the brain is perfectly healthy. So what it starts to do is it starts to uh, fill in the gaps, like I said, and it starts to produce its own spontaneous activity. Now, this doesn't happen in everyone, but in the people that it does happen in, this can then result in people seeing images uh, such as those faces or the animals or the objects or the shapes that aren't actually there. So the problem is, is that currently we don't actually know that much about it. So we know what I've already said. We know that uh, the brain is reacting to this uh, loss of information and it's filling in the gaps. But because there's been so very little research done on this, it means that we don't actually have any effective treatments. So it means that um, a lot of the time people will be put on uh, mental health medications like antipsychotics. Uh, and for some people that can be really effective, but for a lot of people it isn't. And that's a bit of a problem, especially because although a lot of people who have Charles Bonnet syndrome, they will find that actually the images that they're seeing are quite pleasant or they might be quite interesting. There are quite a lot of people who do also have quite distressing experiences with it. And that can either be because the images are themselves quite scary or upsetting, or it could just be that they're having them all the time. So if you are going about your day, uh, daily routine and then all of a sudden you're seeing a face in front of you while you're trying to do the dishes, this can be really difficult to look past and it can really get in the way and ruin your day. So obviously we really need to have some sort of treatment to be able to help people who are having a really rough time with it. So that's one of the things that we at Newcastle really wanted to target. We really wanted to look at ways that we could potentially treat uh, this symptom to be able to try and help people a little bit who've actually got this. 
So what we decided to do was we tried to look at something that hadn't been used before, um, look at a way of targeting that specific activity that was arising in those visual parts of the brain. And one of the ways that we can actually do this is with something called non-invasive brain stimulation. Now that sounds quite scary, um, but it is what it says on the tin, it's non-invasive. So we don't put anything into the brain itself. There's no uh, electrodes getting stuck into your brain. Uh, there's nothing breaking the skin. What we do is we put a little pad um, on the back of your head. So it goes right here where the visual part of your brain is. And we run a very weak electrical current through uh, those pads. And that electrical current passes through the skin and through your skull and ends up uh, in the area of the brain that we want to target. Now, this particular type of stimulation, which we call transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS for sure, um, it can be used to either increase the activity in a certain part of the brain, or we can decrease the activity. Now, what we really wanted to do was we wanted to decrease that activity in the visual part of the brain, because if we decrease all of that spontaneous activity that shouldn't be there, then we might also then have an effect on the hallucinations, which is what we wanted to look at. The only problem is, is that although this technique has been used in lots of other studies before, it's been used in migraine studies, it's been used in people with tinnitus, it's been used in people um, with various forms of dementia. So we know it's really safe, but it's never been used in Charles Bonnet syndrome. So the problem that we had was we didn't know what sort of stimulation we needed to start giving people. We didn't know where the stimulation needed to be or how strong it needed to be or how long we needed to do it for. So in order to answer those questions so we could have a better idea moving forward, we needed a really special subset of people to come and help us out. So what we did was the first part of our study was we asked six people who have continuous visual hallucinations. So this means that they are hallucinating from the minute they wake up in the morning until the minute they go to sleep at night, which is understandably quite awful. But the benefit of these people was that it meant that when we gave them the stimulation, they could tell us exactly what was going on in real time. So they could tell us whether the hallucinations were being affected by the stimulation, um, whether they were changing in their quality or whether they were stopping altogether. So what we did was we asked them to come down to the uh, Visual Perceptual Disorders Clinic at King's College London. So we were working in collaboration with King's and they uh, came down for the day and they let us stimulate them. So what we did was we tried different areas of the brain, usually around the back, which is where the visual parts of the brain are. Uh, and we would try different locations and we would try different strengths of stimulation. And we would ask them uh, to tell us after we did the stimulation, what had changed. Um, and everyone was really helpful. It was a wonderful day out for everyone. And um, we found actually some really positive results from this, um, which was really exciting. So we found that out of the six people that we uh, asked to participate, four of them said that the stimulation or at least one of the stimulations we performed had had a positive effect on their hallucinations so this could either be that the hallucination had gotten smaller or we found that their hallucination maybe was less defined so like the edges were a little bit blurrier so it was easier to ignore um, also that they were less bright and in some cases, if they had moving ones, that they were less um, in motion. So there was less movement going on. Now, the surprising thing that we weren't expecting to find was actually uh, that for a lot of these people, they also reported that they had better access to the remaining vision that they had. Now, this isn't something we were expecting because everybody, of course, in the study, they had... Um, eye diseases so the problem with their vision was from the eyes not the brain and it wasn't actually the fact that we weren't actually improving their vision it wasn't a case of we were making any of their eye disease better 
what we were finding was that because the hallucinations had usually taken up so much of their attention or had taken up so much of their actual eyesight, that when we were reducing things like the size or uh, how intense it was, that was actually giving them more access to the vision that they um, had remaining. So a lot of these people had things like a peripheral vision and um, when we reduced the size of the hallucination, it meant that they could use that peripheral vision a little bit more effectively. So they could make out, for example, fingers that we were holding up, uh, or they could make out features on my face, uh, which was an improvement for them. And like I say, was surprising, but a really positive response. Now, the problem that we have here is, although this is a really exciting result, we have to take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt. So firstly, as you will probably have already realized, this is a very small sample, it's only six people. And this particular sample is also very unique. So people who have continuous hallucinations throughout the day, it's not very common in Charles Bonnet syndrome. Uh, they're definitely in the minority of people. So there's a chance that while it could work, for people who have continuous hallucinations, the stimulation might not be affected for the majority of people uh, who have more episodic hallucinations. So we really needed to be able to test this out. The other consideration as well is something that we call a placebo effect. Um, so this is an effect where when people have a treatment, they might get a really strong positive treatment effect, which is great, but there might not be an actual physiological reason for that. So it could be, for example, that the, the brain is responding to something, but it's not actually changing anything physically. Uh, so that was something else we needed to actually assess as well. So the way that we did this was we set up a new trial in Newcastle. And this was going to be a larger trial, so we were looking for a larger sample. Um, and we were going to ask people to come in and they would have stimulation on two separate weeks. So on one week, they would have stimulation, um, which was real. So it was the active stimulation. And then on the other week, they would have a stimulation that was pretend or the placebo. And what we wanted to see was, was there a difference between these two weeks? Was the active stimulation more effective than this placebo? So what we did was we asked 16 people, which again is quite a small sample, but considering the fact that Charles Bonnet syndrome uh, is often very underreported in people with eye disease, it's actually quite large and it's one of the largest studies to date that has been done in, in people with Charles Bonnet. So we asked 16 people to come and help us out. And uh, as I said, they entered two weeks of stimulation and it was completely randomized and we have no idea who was having what stimulation at what time. So the people who were volunteering didn't know, I didn't know, the rest of the research team didn't know. So that helped us uh, be able to make sure that we were definitely getting the right results and that we weren't influencing anything. And what one of the things that was different about this was that we actually decided to give people stimulation over four consecutive days. And this is because there's quite a lot of evidence that says that this stimulation can actually be additive. So you can have a cumulative effect. Um, and that if you have stimulation over multiple days, that it can in, uh, increase the effects and it can um, help to improve how long they last as well. So what we did was we were giving people a 20 minute session, 20 to 30 minute session of stimulation every day for four days. And again, this was either the real or the pretend, the placebo. Um, what we also did was we asked when people came into the study if they would have a brain scan at the start. So before they started any of the stimulations. And then again at the end of the week after they'd finished all the stimulations. And we did that for both weeks. And this was mainly to tell us uh, whether there was any sort of observable changes that we could see in the brain that was as a result of the stimulation. So this was quite an important aspect of the study. So again, um, we also used the uh, stimulation parameters 
that we had uh, found during the first part of the study, the one in London. So we found that there was a specific part of the brain that seemed to be the sweet spot. So that was the what we call the primary visual uh, cortex. And that is the very earliest re uh, region of the visual brain. Uh, and it's where all of the information goes to from your eyes to begin with. And that, when we stimulated that spot, that seemed to be the place where people reported the best um, stim uh, outcomes from it. And we also had uh, a stimulation intensity as well that seemed to work really well, which was called, uh, which is one milliamp of stimulation, which seems very small, but like I said, it was a very weak current, but it seemed to be the most effective. So we use this moving forward in our trial in Newcastle. Now again, we actually ended up having some really positive results. Um, and at the end of it, what we found was that when we asked people how their hallucinations were after the stimulation, when we compared it to the uh, ratings that they'd given to their hallucinations at the beginning of the week, we found that there was actually a really significant decrease in the frequency of the hallucinations, but specifically only on the week where they had the active stimulation. So there was a significant decrease in the frequency of the hallucinations when the stimulation was active, but not when the stimulation was a placebo. So that suggests to us that this stimulation was actually being really effective at reducing how many hallucinations people were having throughout the week, which is of course very, very positive. One of the other things that we also found was that people were um, also reporting that their hallucinations were less intrusive. So this is um, when the hallucinations are taking up their vision or getting in the way of things that they were doing, people were reporting that that intrusiveness had actually dropped. And again, this was something that we specifically saw significantly on the week where they were having the real stimulation as opposed to the placebo. So again, that suggests that the stimulation itself is the thing that's effective. Now, where the mystery comes in, because there's always mysteries in science, um, and always unanswered questions, when we looked at brain scans, um, which compared before the stimulation and after the stimulation, we actually found that there wasn't anything that we could see that had physically changed. Now, this was a bit puzzling because obviously we had seen that there was no um, effective, there was no change in the way that people were perceiving their hallucinations on the placebo week, but there was on the active. But there what didn't seem to be anything correlating with the actual brain activity. But this might actually be because we were actually looking in the wrong places. So the, halluc uh, the brain activity that we were looking at was something called functional activity. And that looks at people's brain activity, in this case, between when they were doing nothing at all and when they were moving their eyes. Now, this wasn't actually when they were actually having hallucinations. This was outside of this. So it might be that the activity that we changed was the spontaneous bursts of activity that I was mentioning earlier and not actually the general activity that was going on um, all the time. So we might have reduced the likelihood of those spontaneous bursts occurring and that wouldn't really show up on the scans that we were doing. Similarly, we did some scans which also looked at brain chemistry. So it looked at the chemicals in your brain that increase or decrease its activity. And again, we didn't see anything different, but it might also be because we weren't looking over a long enough period of time and that we weren't looking at some of the more specific brain chemicals um, that are quite hard to quantify. So we haven't looked at them, but they might actually be the ones that are the most important. So as a result, we have a lot more work still left to do. So we really need to start looking at things uh, like, for example, how the brain communicates with itself. We think that's probably going to be something that's quite important. So the brain is constantly sending signals to other parts of the brain and it's how it coordinates everything. Um, and sometimes we found in other conditions and other conditions as well that have visual hallucinations that the 
communication between these different regions can sometimes be a little bit um, either uh, impaired or it's been stopped a little bit or a bit like a telephone line that's got crackling on one end so you can't really hear what the other person's saying. So we need to start looking at that as well in terms of Charles Bonnet syndrome to see whether people are, um, the communication between these regions is affected in these people. Uh, similarly as well, looking at some of the more, uh, more of the brain chemicals as well uh, and trying to get more sensitive measures of it, that will also help us to understand both why Charles Bonnet syndrome occurs in the first place, but also what sort of effect that the stimulation is having on the brain and why that's helping the hallucinations. So we, like I say, we've still got quite a lot left to do. Um, however, this particular study, as I mentioned earlier, it's actually the largest Charles Bonnet syndrome study that has been done in the world to date of this kind. So it is um, a really good stepping stone for us to be able to actually continue this research. Uh, and it's given us some really important information as well to carry forward. And of course, that wouldn't be possible if it weren't for people like the Macula Society who funded the study, uh, and also all the people who got involved in the research as well, and who uh, volunteered their time and their patience and let me come out every day and uh, talk to them about their hallucinations and also give them this stimulation. So I'd just like to take the opportunity to give them a big thank you. Uh, because they have really contributed to this and, and none of this would exist without them. So I'm going to open this up as well to some questions. So if anyone would like to ask anything about the study itself uh, or what we're planning to do in the future, then please feel free. And I hope that you've enjoyed my talk.